You're watching the Spirit Food Christian Center Worldwide Webcast, broadcasting live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Yes, amen, hallelujah. When Spirit Food comes to you, blessings will flow. Say yes. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, pleasing in your sight, in your presence. Oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So Father, thank you. Thank you, Father. So the last time that I taught, we, when we were together, I was teaching on this subject, are you a faithful and lo lo lawyer steward? We interrupt this previous message to report a cloud that's forming. Exodus 13, 21 says, And the Lord, Yahweh, the self-existent one, the one who is eternal, the one who is everlasting, went before them, the children of Israel, by day in a pillar of cloud. And what what was that purpose? He, that purpose was to lead and guide the children of Israel. My question to you this morning, are you following the cloud or the crowd? Which one? And only you can answer that question. Are you following the cloud or the crowd? So the, the cloud is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. It's symbolic of his presence, his guidance, and his function. And so we should be following the cloud if we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he manifests his presence to us, we're aware of his presence, presence, and he guides us, and he functions in our lives. In John chapter 14, and by the way, I will be re, uh, using the King James Version as well as sometimes the Amplified to amplify it. And so, John 14, 16, 17, 26, it says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. That word abide means to take up residence, to live inside. He says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world, those of the lost, those who are the unsaved, those who are rejecting Jesus, whom the world cannot receive, why? Because it seeth him not, and neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. And when this comforter, 26, when this comforter, the intercessor, the standby, the strengthener, who stands alongside you, when this comforter is come, he will send, whom my father will send in my name, he shall teach, he shall instruct you in all things and bring all things to your remembrance. He will bring those things to your remembrance if you trust him. Whatsoever I have said unto you. He said the Holy Spirit, who is the cloud is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And he said he's going to teach you all things. He will instruct you. And he said he'll bring all those things to your remembrance. And so if you're having challenges with your memory, just remind the Holy Spirit, you said in your word 
that you will bring all things to my remembrance. But the key is you got to put something in there in order for him to bring it to your remembrance. So what we're going to look at, we're going to look at uh, a few examples. We're going to go to, Joseph, uh, to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. And Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers because of the spirit of jealousy. And that's why you cannot, as parents, cannot show favoritism for one child over another. Because what are you doing? You giving them place to operate in a spirit of jealousy. And this is what happened with Joseph. He was telling him about all his dreams. Sometimes you just don't share everything. Only be led by the Holy Spirit. And so, in starting at verse 7, in Genesis 39, we're going to start at verse 7 for time's sake. And it came to pass, after these things, that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. She cast his eyes on him and told him, said, lie with me. But he didn't follow her plan. He followed God's plan. And so he says in verse 8, but he refused. Take a lesson, brothers in Christ. Hello. All that looks good is not good. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master was not that it with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath into my hands. In other words, he's saying, Joseph said, I'm in charge of everything here. Verse 9. There is none greater in this house than I. He's the top dog next to Potiphar. Neither hath he kept back anything from me because thou art his wife. How then? I want you to pay attention to this, what I'm going to read here. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin First, she says, against God. When you miss the mark, when you sin, you're not sinning against yet, but you're also sinning against God. He said, how can I do this? My man of integrity, a man of honor. And that's what we, have, we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ must possess. This is the Old Testament. Jesus hadn't manifested in the flesh yet. He says, how can I sin against God? Get that. Because the things that I'm going to share later, you must remember that when these things happen, we are sinning, they are sinning against God. Verse 10, and it came to pass as she spake to Joseph, she bombarded him day in and day out that he hearkened not unto her to lie with her or to be with her. Verse 11, it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. That was his first mistake. She had been with, she's been after him all this time bombarding him, come lie with me. Then when, that's what you get with the left brain thinker and the right brain thinker. Because that right brain thinker would have said, okay, no men here, I better leave. But he was focused. That's what meant their focus. Their focus on the job. 
And so that's what he was focused on. He wasn't paying attention that, oh, he's alone with this woman. Hello, message. Hello, being alone. Hello. Verse 12. And she caught him by his garment, saying, again, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled. He didn't hang around, people. He fled. That means he rushed out of there full speed. Sometimes you better learn how to flee. Don't hang around and try to hold a discussion on a dialogue. That's how many times people get in trouble. You're trying to hold a dialogue over something that's evil and that's have a plan to turn you away from the cloud. Don't let it happen. Now here's another example. Daniel. Go to Daniel chapter 6. In Daniel chapter 6, we're looking at In Daniel chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 7. I'm not going to read all the verses for time's sake. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Then Daniel was preferred above the precedents and princes because an excellent spirit. This is what we should be exhibiting to the world, an excellent spirit. He said, Daniel had an excellent spirit. Be because, and I can call, call it, can't read up here, you guys. Okay. Because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. So because of Daniel's excellent spirit, the king was impressed. And he said, okay, I'm going to set Daniel over all the other, the precepts and the precedents and all of that. So let's go now to verse 10. It says, and now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. So what happened, I better back up a minute. What happened was, these other people that were in charge who Daniel was over, they, here again, the spirit of jealousy crept in. So, but because Daniel had an excellent spirit, they couldn't find any fault with him. He says, oh, I know how we can trap him, entrap him. Beware of the entrapments, people. I know how we can entrap him. We can entrap him because of his God. They saw how dedicated he was to his God. And so they went in cahoots and said that we'll get him because we know that he's faithful to his God. So let's look at verse uh, 11. Well, I want to drop down to verse 13. Then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, not the decree that thou hast signed, but make it his petition three times a day. So they had tricked the king into, into signing this decree that you could not petition your God in so many days. And they knew that they could get Daniel here because he was faithful to have communication with his, his God. And then they said, so you write this decree and put it in, into writing. And they reminded him, the king, King Darius, that the Medes and the Persians, once you decree a thing, it can be reversed, can be revoked. So they tricked the king because the king was very impressed with Daniel because he had an excellent spirit. And so they 
trick the king into signing this document. And so let's go to the next scripture. Let's look at verse 16. It says, then the king commanded. Well, let me go up to verse uh, 15. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians here, that no decree nor statute which is the king established may be changed. He, they're reminding him. And verse 16 says, Then the king commanded that they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Listen to what this pagan king is saying to Daniel. Thou God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver you. Daniel was so faithful and demonstrating such a witness to the Jehovah God that this pagan king was so impressed that he believed that Daniel would be delivered from the lion's den. A pagan king who had not accepted the, in Jewish Judaism. He said, but your God, how much stronger do we have with the word? How are you believing what God says in your life? Are you trusting him? Or are you looking at the circumstances? If this pagan king who did not have a covenant with Jehovah, but trusted that his, his God, Daniel's God, would deliver him. And you know the rest of the story, like Paul Harvey says, I trust you do. Guess what? They threw him in. But what happened? What's the result? The result is... What the king had declared to Daniel, that's what happened. He was a good verse 22. So the king was concerned, and he immediately, in verse 19, went there to check on Daniel. And verse 22, he says, My God has sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocent was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Daniel was looking at the cloud. He kept his eyes focused. He did what he's always done. He continued to pray. Even when he got the decree, he continued to pray three times. He didn't change his habit because he got a bad report. Hello? Just because you get a bad report, don't change your declaration. Say what the Word of God says. Let's, let's go to another one. Hebrews, the Hebrew boys, Daniel chapter 3. We're still in Daniel. In Daniel chapter 3. So here again, the Hebrews, the Hebrew boys... Nebuchadnezzar had made this statue, and he wanted everybody to bow to this statue. You have some statues here that people want you to bow to. Doesn't have to be a physical statue, can be an ideology. But don't follow the crowd, follow the cloud, follow the word of God. So he says here in verse 4, he says, Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down, and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. 
And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fire. Verse 7. He says, therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, has set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree and they name all those musical instruments again and tell them that they should fall down and worship it. And verse 11, and whoso falleth not down and worship, that he would be cast into the midst of the burning fire. There are certain Jews. This could be translated as certain Christians today because we're not falling down to Baal and his system. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thou gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. And so when they brought them, they said, okay. King said, I'll, you know, I'll give you another chance. Now when you hear this music, these instruments, you need to fall down. Let's go to verse 17. If it be so, our God, whom you serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But listen to verse 18. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thou gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. He says, be it known. So say, for example, he said, if, they, if he doesn't, just know this, I'm not bound down to your idol. See, your idol can be anything. A person, statue, an ideology. An ideology is real strong. He said, just know this, I'm still not going to bow. I don't care what you do to me. You can throw me in this fiery furnace, but I refuse to bow. Are you saying the same thing? Are you refusing to bow to what's going on in our nation? Don't bow to the culture. Bow to the cloud, the Holy Ghost, his presence, his leading. He's, the, he's called the spirit of truth. We read it in John. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, they don't receive it because they reject it. But he, he said, I will not bow. I trust you're saying the same thing. Regardless of what the consequences are, you stand strong and say, I will not bow to this culture. I will only bow my knee to the word of God. Because you're strong in him and in the power of his might. You are bold as a lion and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And of course, they were thrown in the fiery furnace, but guess what? God delivered them. Go to John 16, chapter 16. The Gospel of John, chapter 16. So these three gentlemen in the Old Testament, they refused to succumb to the culture. They refused 
to bow to anything but Jehovah, who is the self-existing one. Uh, chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 13 and 14. It says, how be it when he, that's the person of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you, direct you unto all truth. The Holy Spirit will never direct you into error. Know this. If it doesn't line up with, with Scripture, it's an error. He says, know you the spirit of truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He will reveal things to you. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Remember, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. So you don't have to go for the okie doke. Go for the truth. That's the line up with Scripture. I don't care who it is or what it is. If it's not lining up with Scripture, you are not under no obligation to receive it. Because he is truth. Go to Acts chapter 1. Go to Acts chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 8 and 9. Acts chapter 1. Verses 8 and 9. I think during this, uh, Christians have to become aware, have a, a spiritual awakening of what you're dealing with. We're dealing with demonic forces. We're dealing with spiritual warfare. And first John, it te test the spirits. Prove those spirits. And is it a God or not? But though that spirit that is, says that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, it's an antichrist spirit. So if they're saying anything other than what this Bible is saying, you don't receive it, reject it. So in Acts 1.8, he talks about us being a witness. He says, well, ye shall receive power, dunamis, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him up. Witnessing. He says, you shall be a witness. How do you do that? How do I do that? When we are witnesses, we, you're going to be awed and overwhelmed by God's holiness. You're not going to treat it as commonplace. When we come together, it says, we will gather to worship, praise, and adore him. When we were worshiping, praising this morning, we shouldn't treat it as oh, another song or commonplace. But knowing that you are what? Are in communion with the Holy of Holies. When we come in and come in with a different attitude, He's not common. He's uncommon. Come in with a different attitude. To worship. Truly worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Be quick to repent. What is that word repent? Change the direction that you're going. You're going in the wrong direction? Change your direction. Renew your mind. Stop renewing your mind. Stop your mind being renewed with the culture. The Bible says renew your mind, renewing, ongoing. Not having 
heard something once, and then you think you got it, that's when the devil going to come in and trip you up. You're not all that and a bag of chips. None of us are. We are growing. We have to depend upon the Holy Spirit. I have to depend on the Holy Spirit. Moment by moment, second by second. Why? Because this flesh here want to give you a piece of my mind which I can't afford to give you. Desire holiness to rule and reign in your life. Why do you desire that? Because he tells us in 1 Peter, be ye holy. That's imperative. Be ye holy. Why? Because I'm holy. And we're his offsprings. And so we should desire to be what he is and be that witness. The only Jesus they're going to see is the Jesus in us. And sad, many of us have fallen short of being that witness. So we're going to look at the, uh, my second point. Let's look at the crowd. The crowd is symbolic. Listen to this. The crowd is symbolic of those who follow their own righteousness their own truth. You've heard the, this, the saying, your truth, my truth. There's only one truth, Amen. and that's the Holy Ghost. You, oh, or your truth and my truth. Hogwash. Reject. These are people, the crowd, the people that reject and disdain God's word. They hate it. They hate you because you represent God's word. Jesus already gave us the ammunition. He said, the world is not going to like you. Now, if you're looking for the world to love you, then you're trying to follow their plan because they're not going to like you. So be prepared. He said it. If they hate me, they're going to hate you. So we're not above the master. They hated the master. Guess what? And if you're trying to fit in with the, with the, with the crowd, you're going to miss out. And Satan is definitely going to entrap you. So I don't have time to go to to Exodus, so I'm going to go, to go to Luke chapter 23. We're talking about following the crowd. But I want you to write this down if you're taking notes, and you should be. Aaron, uh, we, you're going to read about Aaron in Exodus 32, 1 through 5 and 22. Just read the whole chapter, and it'll show you how Aaron, he bend to the crowd instead of following the cloud. And then lied about it and say, well, I told them to give me all their gold when, when Moses came down from the mountain. I told them to give me all their gold and all the gold they had, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. You read the scriptures above, it tells you that's not what happened. What happened was he, he did tell him authority, but what did he shaped? He formed and shaped the idol. And they began to worship the idol. People are worshiping idols today. Let's go to, what did I say, Luke? Go to Luke. If you can put Luke up on, uh, in your regular print so I can read it, because I'm having problems reading this one. Luke, chapter 23. Go to Luke, chapter 23. 
So, in Luke chapter 23, let's go to verse 22. So, Pilate here, Jesus was before Pilate. And they were having court day here for him. And to save time, I'm going to start at verse 22. And he said unto them the third time. So Pilate was talking to these religious leaders who were the ones that brought Jesus, wanted him to be crucified. And he said unto them the third time. So he had already told them three times that I find no fault in him. And he said unto them the third time, what, why, why do you want him crucified? Religious leaders, that's why you don't follow religion. You follow a relationship, and his name is Jesus. Religion will kill you. And he said unto them the third time, why, what evil has he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. In other words, they conquered, and Pilate gave in. Now, Pilate has said three times that I find no fault in him. So if you find no fault in him, why wouldn't you let him go? Then, in, in I think the Gospel of Matthew, his wife told him, man, sometimes that's why you need to listen to your wives. They hear stuff that you don't hear. His wife told him, don't do anything to this man, because I had a dream about him. So Pilate bend to the crowd. He received pressure from the crowd. Don't allow a crowd or anybody to pressure you into doing what's wrong, into doing what's not in line with God's word. People will try to do that. But you better stand strong and steadfast. Don't bend to what they want you to do. Or bend and do what they want you to say. I'm only going to say what this word of God says. Nothing more, nothing less. I will not bow to Baal's system. I don't care how hot it gets, how hot the furnace is, like they, the Hebrew boy says. It doesn't matter. I don't care how hot. We're not going to bow to you. I don't care what you do to me. I'm not bowing. So Pilate gave in, and he followed the crowd. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. And I want this Romans chapter 1 in the Amplified Version, please. Romans chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 18. Okay. Are you there? Okay, so I don't want you missing this. So I want everybody there. Well, look up on the screen. Yeah, thank you. Whew. Verse 118. For God's holy wrath and indignation are revealed from heaven against some unrighteousness, 
Is that what that say? It says what? All. all unrighteousness. Ungodliness, all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who in their wickedness. Verse 2. Repress and hinder the truth and make it inoperative. Verse 19. For that which is known about God is evident. For that which is known about God is evident. It's obvious to them and made plain in their inner consciousness because God himself has shown it to them. That's why in one, he said that man is without excuse because it's a built-in consciousness that we have. Next verse. Verse 20. For ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature and attributes. Hello, my God, character people, and attributes. That is his eternal power and divinity have been made intelligible and clearly discernible in and through the things that have been made, his handiwork. You know, just look at God's handiwork. You're without excuse. So men are without excuse altogether, without any defense or justification. You don't have any. You're without excuse. Next verse, 21. Because when they knew and recognized him as God, they did not honor and glorify him as God or give him thanks. But instead, they became futile and need you to move it, and godless in their thinking. See, that's where the, where the challenge is, is here, in their thinking. With vain imagination, imaginings, foolish reasoning, and stupid speculations, and their senseless minds were what? I need it up there. Darkened. Verse 22. Claiming, listen to this, claiming to be wise. We got a lot of folks going around here thinking they're smart. They so smart, they're changed science. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. The Bible calls them fools. Hello? So I'm going to agree with the Bible. They're fools. Professing to be smart, they made simpletons of themselves. Next verse, 23. And by them the glory and majesty and excellence of the immortal God were exchanged for and represented by images resembling mortal man and birds and beasts and reptiles. 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust. That's concupiscence. Lust of their own hearts to sexual in more impurity. Boy, are we seeing this today. To the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, abandoning them to the degrading power of sin. Because they exchanged 
the truth. They exchanged the truth. The truth. Don't tell me about, oh, well, you know, this and that. No, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Now, I'm not putting anybody back. I'm just telling you what the Bible says, and I believe this Bible. And he said that they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So be it. Next verse. For this reason, see, when you make a choice, and decisions, there are consequences, good or bad. For this reason, God gave them over and abandoned them to vile affections and degrading passions for their women exchanged their natural function for an unnatural and abnormal one. And the men also turned from natural relations with women and were set ablaze, burning out, consumed with lust for one another. Men committing shameful acts with men and suffering in their own bodies and personalities the inevitable consequences and penalty of their wrongdoing and going astray, which was their fitting retribution. Verse 28. Verse 28, no? Okay, let me read it from the Amplified, uh, from my Bible. It's nice to see it up there. Okay. And so since they did not see fit to acknowledge God or approve of him or consider him worth the knowing, listen to what the word of God saying. God gave them over to a based and condemned mind to do the things not proper or decent but loathsome. Verse 29. Until they were filled, permeated, and saturated with every kind of unrighteousness, iniquities, grasping, and covetous greed and malice. They were full of envy and jealousy, murder, strife, deceit and treachery, ill will and cruel ways. They were secret backbiters and gossipers. Verse 30, slanderers, hateful to and hating God, full of insolence, arrogance and boasting, inventors of new forms of evil, disobedient and un dutiful to parents, 31. They were without understanding, consciousness, conscious, consciousness, and faithless, heartless, and loveless, and merciless. Though they are fully aware of God's righteousness decree, but that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them, themselves, but listen to this, but approve. If you're approving of what's going on, you're falling in this category here. I'm just telling you. See, I'm here to tell the truth. You can like me or don't like me. I'm not here for you to like me or like me or don't like me. I'm here to give you the truth of God's word. And I will not compromise because of what's going on in culture. Never I'm going to compromise. I'm going to tell you the truth because I love you enough to tell you the truth. When people don't tell you the truth, they don't love you, they hate you. 
They applaud others. Have we seen this? They approve and applaud others who practice them. You need to go home and read this chapter, this, this verse that we covered today. So you can understand what you're seeing and going on. You have a better understanding. And then you have a better understanding how to minister to people. Because every, every time we minister to someone who's fallen in this category, it's not for condemnation or judgment. It's because we love them. I love you enough to tell you the truth. You should love someone enough to tell them the truth. There's a way to say it. God will give you the grace. He'll give you the grace. Just, Father, help me. I want to show your love, your grace, but I must speak the truth in love. And I'm telling you, he'll do it every time. Now, if he uses my personality in, in grace, he definitely can use yours. Because he gives me the grace and the love to minister to people on one-on-one. -on -one. And he'll do it for you. He's not a respecter person. Amen? Are you following the cloud? Or are you following the crowd? Make sure that you're following the crowd. Amen? I want to thank you for tuning in today's lesson. If you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then I'm going to lead you into a confession of faith. If you say these words after me, you can become a child of the living God. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let us pray these words now, believing these words in our heart, and saying them with our mouth. Dear God, I believe in my heart you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. He was crucified. His blood was shed to wash me clean. And dear God, you raised him from the dead. So I confess with my mouth now, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. You are alive. I believe this in my heart. And because I confess you as my Lord, I am now a child of the living God. Father, thank you for making me your very own. I will live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to thank you for your continual support of this broadcast of Spirit Food Christian Center. We're so grateful for your participation. I'd like to give you an opportunity to participate by our Push Pay app. Text my SFCC to the number 77977. You'll receive further instruction on how to give. We're so grateful and thankful for your continual support and love. Remember, you're helping to make it happen. In Jesus' name, you amen. Are the sun.